When I'm doing coloured mouldings, I try to be as efficient as possible. Uh, I listed these face mask straps on eBay and they've been selling a little bit more quickly than I expected, so I've had to run off another batch. Uh, and I didn't write down the settings, so my first few cycles uh, I had short shots coming through. Uh, need a little bit more plastic, but I soon got that going. If I put too much in it would have just flashed over, but uh, that's just a, a case of getting the shot weight right. And um, once I'd done off a batch of yellows, I tend to shift into greens because the green masks the yellow fairly quickly. Uh, so it only took a handful of cycles before all of the yellow had gone and was being replaced with the green colouring. And then when I finished greens, I tend to go into blues and there's a little bit of blue coming through here. And again, because blue is a slightly darker colour than the greens, it doesn't take very long for the blue to come through properly. There's still a little bit of mottling here, but not a great deal. Uh, so probably about three or four cycles, which isn't uh, all that bad. Uh, then I tend to go into uh, reds. Normally I would, I would do a purple between blues and reds because the blue and the red will mix and give a kind of purpley colour anyway. So you may as well do a purple while you're at it. But it took a few more cycles to get the reds coming through cleanly. Uh, and this one's almost there. There's just a little tiny bit of blue uh, at either end where it's feeding in off the main gates. Uh, and then obviously once you've got rid of the, the red, uh, you move on to black, and black is pretty easy because it covers pretty much any colour you've got. But despite my best efforts at being efficient, you always get a few of these. Some people do actually like the kind of tie-dye effect. Uh, depends on, on the colourants and the material. Some colourants blend better than others. You can actually get immiscible colourants where you can add two and get a kind of wood grain effect, uh, which is kind of a nice effect, but uh, I haven't seen many companies that actually stock that. Uh, but I have seen uh, at least one company fairly recently that did manage to find some, and they were doing some fairly creative uh, gun stock mouldings, actually, and they look pretty much like wood grain. Uh, but standard colourants, uh, generally you just want to get them running pure. Uh, and then obviously these are all the sprues that I've chopped off. So all of these and all of these, and down here on the floor, I also have a bucket of all of the, uh, the runners out of the center. And all of this lot now needs to go back into the granulator, which gives me an excuse to show you what's involved in the granulator. And basically all of this lot will get munched up back into granules and can then be run into black. Uh, if I was doing significant batches of particular colors, I tend to keep the colors separate, any waste uh, from there. Uh, and then I will regrind those in a similar process. I'll start with the lightest colours, work my way through a, an appropriate colour wheel, uh, and then I'm getting back pretty much pure colour uh, granulate, which I can then mould again as colour. But if you've got it all mixed up like here, you're going to end up with uh, mixed colourant, which will come out a mucky brown if you try and mould it as is. But you just chuck a bit of ma black master batch in uh, and turn it all into black. So nothing gets wasted, uh, but I've now got to granulate all of this. Uh, and uh, then probably mould another batch of black with it. So this is uh, my granulator. There's a, uh, an auxiliary feed at the top and sometimes granules come up here, hence the nose bag on the horse's head here. This does actually lift off, so you could put a conveyor feed straight into there. For my purposes, I'm just feeding in through the main inlet here and then collecting uh, the granules out of a tray at the bottom here, which I'll show you in a moment. And then on the side here, there is a hose pipe going up and there is another bag on the back of there because uh, there's actually a centrifugal blower at the back here which can feed the granules up and out uh, and into a suitable uh, packing station, uh, which I don't use, uh, but uh, I put a bag on there because you do get granules coming up. Normally you would uh, tie this into something called a cyclone, which is basically like a hopper. It's just a, a big um, drum and the plastic comes in from the side, swirls round and all the granules drop out the bottom, very much like a kind of industrial cyclone Dyson vacuum cleaner kind of affair. Uh, I haven't got one on this machine because I don't really need it, but if you're granulating an awful lot of material, it makes no sense to be taking it out the bottom uh, bit by bit. You just keep chucking it in, blow it up through a hose into a cyclone and then down into a bag. Uh, haven't got one here obviously, but uh, we do have a production site, uh, I don't know, about an hour away from here where we have a closed loop so anything that comes off the line all the runners and everything they go straight into a granulator back through a cyclone and then back down into uh, the main hopper again 
as with most industrial machines there's a control cabinet down here which has just got all the breakers and the wiring in it's all point to point uh, and then over here there's a, an auxiliary power outlet uh, which just loops through from the three phase uh, and then the main power of this thing is a, a big three phase motor over there and this big drum which is all belt drive because obviously if anything jams you don't want a, a direct uh, chain or gear drive on this the belts will slip if there's uh, anything jamming the mechanism uh, which is why it's pretty grubby in there because uh, that does happen on occasion and obviously it wears the belts and you get uh, rubber dust going everywhere so that's what all that black filth is normally obviously there's a, a cover over here I've just taken it off so it's a fairly straightforward mechanism really it's just a motor and a grinder at this end a big uh, chopping blade which we'll see in a moment around the back we have an entry door which shows us the motor there's obviously uh, emergency stops all over these things because they don't take prisoners and up here is uh, a pin which you have to take all the way out and there's actually a micro switch in there which clicks when it's engaged so this is just an interlock it does take quite a lot of screwing to get this out so they're pretty serious about the safety on this and there we go and this is actually quite a nicely made pin it's all uh, one piece of steel all knurled on the end this is a bit flimsy it's just a piece of angle iron but uh, they have gilded the lily in a few places at least so here we've got uh, a rather large three-phase motor uh, and that's uh, the main drive and it gives you an idea of the size of that thing uh, how much power there is in these uh, granulators on the front there's another access door which we need to spin open and then these are the clamping bar and nuts to actually get into it. There we go. And with that out of the way, we can have a look at the insides. And that just swings back like that. It's quite heavy, but you can see why there is the, uh, the interlock pin on the rear. Uh, so that you can't actually flip this back until such time as that pin is removed. This is the heart of the mechanism. It's basically quite a heavy duty yoke uh, and most noticeable feature is it's hollow. This is so that uh, the plastic can get basically trapped in the center here uh, and swirled around as it spins. If this were solid, you wouldn't have a great deal of space to actually uh, contain the plastic as you're munching it up into granules. These blades have seen better days, but they don't need to be razor sharp for what they're doing. It's more about momentum. Uh, and these are obviously removable and interchangeable if necessary. Uh, this has uh, been used and there's still a few bits sticking in here. Uh, they haven't quite gone through. There is a, a grill at the back here, obviously. And once the chopped up uh, granules are small enough to fall through the grill, they'll drop down into uh, the little uh, tray at the bottom and either get sucked out the back and blown through the hose into uh, a bag or uh, through a cyclone and into a bag or alternatively they just accumulate in the tray and then you empty that every once in a while. Uh, this thing uh, once it gets up to speed will chop through pretty much anything so you don't want anything uh, fragile going through there or, or even quite robust in fact that's a, a penny which went through some years ago and I uh, heard a horrible clatter and managed to get the thing out. Fortunately, this was a steel penny, not a copper one, so I was able to fish it all out with uh, a magnet. But uh, nevertheless, I still scrapped that batch of material because I didn't want to take any chances. Uh, what else can I say about this? There's some dust around here, which uh, they call fines in the trade, and they're not ideal. Some plastics granulate better than others. This has been working on a fairly rubbery material, uh, so it's... Uh, a little bit more powdery, fluffy than uh, you would normally get, but nevertheless the granules come out okay. Nylon is particularly bad on this and other high temperature materials, not so much because it won't chop them up, it will, you can put fair sized chunks in here. Uh, the problem with nylon is you always get a little bit of the material trapped in the grill and when you put the next batch through, some of those bits will come through. So if you've done nylon and then you go to a 
softer material, something that melts a little easier, polypropylene, polyethylene, whatever, uh, bits of that nylon are still going to be in there and the nylon won't melt until you get up to about 250 degrees, whereas most of your plastics you're running at about 200 to 20 degrees C. So if you get one little granule of nylon in your next batch of cooler plastic, uh, it's basically not going to melt and it's going to block things up. And then you've got to ramp your temperatures on your machine to melt out the nylon, uh, purge everything out, going too high on some plastics will degrade them. PVC is particularly bad for that. Uh, so it can be a bit of a problem. So if you're running a high temperature material, uh, you really want to clean this out properly, uh, get in there with a vacuum cleaner and get as much of it out as you can. Uh, and ideally the next batch of material you put through wants to be a different colour because then if there are any granules from the previous batch you can see them and pick them out on, you know, you put a kilo or two through, something like that, just so that uh, you're giving it a chance to, to move any residual granules through the system, uh, but then you can see them because they're a different colour and pick them all out. But uh, it's quite an efficient machine, it will chop up uh, material fairly quickly uh, and uh, that's pretty much all there is to it really, uh, just you have to clean it every once in a while and certainly if you're changing colours, again you would start with uh, the lighter colours and work your way through so you can get reasonably good efficiency and not a lot of wastage out of these but it's certainly better than throwing most of your scrap plastic in the bin. This is where it's going to get a bit noisy so be prepared to turn the volume down. <laughs> might be able to hear the tone changing as it chomps its way through it. It's usually a good sign of how much there's still in there and basically the quieter it gets the closer it is to finishing. You'll also hear a kind of throbbing sound uh, if there's quite a lot in there but I haven't put a great deal in and it's only small chunks in the first place so that's probably chopped most of it up. We'll have a quick look. It also slowed down quite quickly which is uh, another good sign that uh, it's used most of what was in there. So let's have a look and see what it's done. Yeah, not much, there's probably still plenty more in there but that's reasonably good quality, uh, jazz as they call it because it's all mixed colours but that's perfectly adequate for uh, remoulding. So. Uh, I'll chop up all the rest of it, granulate everything, and that'll be the next batch for doing some black. And although it looked like quite a lot of plastic going in, uh, it's actually only a few kilos of the stuff. There's uh, some fines on the top here, but that'll all mix in. It's not brilliant quality granulate because it's a slightly softer material, so you don't get nice rounded chunks. You tend to get stringy bits uh, like that. Uh, if you can see that on the end of my finger, that's quite long and thin. Uh, but otherwise, that will reprocess as the bit that's gone through, uh, just fallen through the grills, and one of the feed gates has gone through. That bit, I don't know, would feed back into uh, the, uh, the moulding machine, so I'll take that out. But uh, the rest of this will go in. Normally, you're only supposed to use about 20-25% regrind and mix it in with uh, virgin granules. That helps it flow better and also helps to maintain the consistency. Basically, every time plastic gets heated, it uh, undergoes chain scission and the molecules break down into smaller uh, long polymers, go to shorter and shorter polymers, uh, and eventually it becomes unworkable and loses its strength. So to maintain the strength and consistency, you tend to blend this with fresh material. But if it's a, a non-critical part, you can usually get away with just putting 100% regrind in. So uh, that's all of that material chopped up and ready to go back in and turn into black. And now that that's out of the way, I can show you the bit of the machine which is hidden underneath uh, where it collects the plastic and feeds it through to that centrifugal blower.
by which I mean this bit here. So there's a centrifugal fan in there and that hooks onto the end of the uh, receptacle here with uh, just a little toggle clamp, but I don't tend to use that. So I shut that exit off with a bit of tape, uh, which probably needs replacing. Uh, and also as a final touch, I tend to put a tray under here just to collect any granules that come through because if I bang that, where the grill is, there's still a few bits in there. So when I clean this out uh, with a vacuum cleaner, I will vacuum under there and all around here and obviously in the tray itself just to make sure that I've got all the pieces so that uh, the next batch isn't contaminated. So there's not a lot to these machines. They're quite well built, sturdily machines. Uh, probably use quite a lot of electric, to be honest, as well. This is far bigger than what I need, but it's what I've got and this is how it works.